So, welcome, welcome. This is our this is the Lightning Jar's fourth signature uh, speaker series event. Um, so we're very excited to have Mary Powell speak. Before we get started, I just want to uh, thank our sponsors. These types of events really cannot uh, happen without the help of community sponsors. So I'll just run down the list here. We have Bank of Bennington, and we have Shannon and Kelly here from Bank of Bennington. There we go. So I'd like to point people out. Right. We have Lori and Heidi from VSCCU here. We have Ginger from Abundant Sun right here, which is good. Greg, I, I saw Greg Van Houten just walk in. Here we go. Yep, from GBH Studios. And uh, with the grill from Mount Anthony and Maru, our sponsors, as well as the folks that are um, doing the food tonight. So, big round of applause for them. From the Bennington Area Chamber, which most folks know that. So again, you know, these types of events, bringing you know top shelf speakers to town, can't happen without really a full community events, uh, community support. So thank, thank you again, to all the sponsors. So hand over to me. Hey folks, so I guess uh, Vermont winter is no match for the community to come out for an event like this. Huh? So thank you and thanks Perry for making the trip down when I looked out the window after my morning meetings. I thought, uh oh, I'm very good and early start, but in the utility business, I guess, you know, bad weather is probably not new. So, so I'm going to, uh, I've got a couple of shameless pitches um, and then we're going to kick things off pretty quickly here. So I just want to talk very briefly about the, the lightning jar and what we're doing, and then I'm going to uh, introduce Mary and let her uh, take it away. So uh, the Lightning Jar has been up and running for two and a half years now. Uh, we are a co-working space located in downtown Bennington. Uh, but, and if you don't know what a co-working space is, we provide uh, open uh, collaborative workspace for entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, freelancers, remote workers, anyone looking for an alternative to uh, a, a, a formal corporate uh, office environment. So folks that are remote workers whose employers are in different parts of the country but would still love to live in southern Vermont, so we're a great fit for those folks. But we're much more than a co-working space. Uh, we're really looking to foster innovation and creativity, and our ultimate goal is really about uh, job creation and new business startups. So we're really positioning ourselves as being the hub of all entrepreneurial activities in southwestern Vermont. We've built a tremendous uh, following and a tremendous brand and a really strong community down here. So that's really what it's about is community and these events are really an important part of that because professional development and collaboration is a really key part to building that, uh, that network and the, the community. So um, that's what we're about and we appreciate that you're here to support us. Uh, I'm excited to announce that we just, this, as Jim mentioned, this is our fourth leadership speaker series and uh, we just booked our fifth one which is gonna be on uh, June 7th, and that's going to be uh, Michael Wood Lewis, who's the uh, co-founder and CEO of Front Porch Forum, which is a really important project around um, creating a community network. It's a little bit like a Craigslist uh, combined with a Facebook, but it's really targeted at local communities for resource sharing. And you know, I'm looking, for, uh, I can't find my cat, or I'm looking for someone who can come right from leaves, and a little bit of sharing economy going on there. And so, uh, really excited to have Michael coming in June. Uh, to tell their story, uh, Real Entrepreneur, Serial Entrepreneur, which fits right into our mission. Uh, so with that behind us, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our speaker, Mary Powell, and this is hot off the press. So Fast Company just listed among the world's most innovative companies for 2018 in the energy sector, number one nationally, sorry, in the world, is Green Mountain Power. So that's So I, uh, Mary's team gave me a giant bio and I said, I'm going to pare it down. And I was only able to take out like two sentences. So, <laughs> to talk about. so uh, Mary Powell is nationally recognized as an energy visionary, positioning Green Mountain Power as a leading energy transformation company. Mary has served as president and chief executive officer for Green Mountain Power since 2008. Under her leadership, Green Mountain Power became the first utility in the world to become a member of a B Corp showing a commitment to use energy as a force for good. Green Mountain Power became the first utility to offer to help uh, customers go off grid, build Vermont's largest wind farm, made Rutland, Vermont the solar generation capital of New England, 
and installed smart grid technology across Green Mountain Power Service territory. In 2012, Mary led the acquisition of Central Vermont Public Service with a promise to generate $144 million in savings for its customers. The company has grown from serving 88,000 customers in 2008 to serving over 260,000 customers, which is like half the population of Vermont, uh, with revenues of more than $640 million and $2 billion in assets. In 2005, Mary led another partnership with Tesla, with Green Mountain Power becoming the first utility anywhere to offer customers the Tesla Powerwall battery, and I hope we'll hear more about that. Uh, and in 2017, Green Mountain Power was named one of the top 10 energy companies in the world by Fast Company. Uh, they've achieved one of the top scores for mid-sized utilities in the East Region in J.D. Power's 2017 Electric Utility Residential Customer Satisfaction Study. Uh, as far as Mary herself, in June, uh, 2014, she was recognized by Power Gen as Woman of the Year. In 2015, the Burlington Free Press named her Vermonter of the Year. In 2016, Fast Company named Mary one of the 100 most creative people in business. And in 2017, Mary was named one of the top 25 most influential women of the mid-market by CEO Connection. And Conscious Capitalism Media named Mary Powell's 2018 list of 30 world-changing women in conscious business. I'm going to leave that up to you. So, <laughs> so thanks, Mary, for coming. love the opportunity to connect uh, with people, uh, to connect with people that, you know, really bottom line is, um, I'm here to serve, you know, because I'm talking to most people, I would imagine, in this audience, that either at your home or your business or somewhere else, uh, you know, you are part of uh, the network of folks that we're here to serve. So. Uh, for me, it is, it is extra special as I've had lots of opportunities because of some of the blah, blah, blah of the stuff we've done. I've had lots of opportunities to speak around the world in different places about energy transformation, about how do we move from this big, bulk, inefficient, uneconomic, not sustainable delivery system to one that is community, home, and business-based. But at the end of the day, my love is to actually when that connects with talking to people uh, that that uh, I'm here to serve, um, and all sorts of good connections come out of that. Um, because I really believe, um, fundamentally, uh, everything we've done, like everything that was described, honestly, like the funny thing to me is, really, it just all came out of the same thing, the same feeling I get when I stand here to talk to you guys tonight, which is, it all came out of our love and our obsession with our customers and building a company at the end of the day. And I just, it was awesome coming down this way because I got a chance to spend some time in our Sunderland office with the gang that works there. And they actually said they were gonna come and heckle me from the back. But I'm so glad they didn't. No, it was, it was nice to connect with them. But really, at the end of the day, everything we do, everything we've accomplished, the culture change that we, I think, have all been a part of creating there, it really comes down to, again, that deep, deep love, obsession, and connection with people. And so for me, it's great, because I get that when I'm here. I like, I like, I feel like the greatest value that comes out of life, actually, um, you know, is the ability to connect with other people. And to do work that matters. And to do work that matters because it connects me with people. You know, I think that's, you know, I, I, uh, I remember I was told that very young in my life, very, very early in my career. Uh, it, was, it was at the time, frankly, I was having a little bit of a personal crisis. I was in my 20s. <laughs> and uh, I was having one of those moments of like, what is the purpose of life anyway? Like those simple, basic questions you ask people. Like, why am I alive? <laughs> why do I exist? You know? And I just remember this, uh, the answer I got was, you know, um, it's really, it's to be a contributing member of society and to learn how to love and be loved. And, uh, you know, really, I'm probably paraphrasing it a little bit incorrect because it was a long time ago, but that's kind of always what has stuck with me. Um, 
And, and it's funny because I get asked a lot about like innovation and thinking differently. And you know, I guess probably some of it goes back to that crisis and some of it goes back to those early days in my life. But I think a part of what has always informed my thinking is sort of two things, sort of that, that kind of thing. Like when I, when I found myself drifting in ways in my career or my life where I forget that fundamental purpose, um, things just don't go as well. Actually, life just doesn't go as well. Life just feels harder. Work feels harder. Problems feel insurmountable. Um, when I love my problems, when I love life, when I come back to that fundamental thing, things go better. Um, and I would say the other theme through my life has been, which is probably why when people say things like, like, how do you think this way? It's like, I, a part of it is, it just, I always fundamentally felt a little bit like an outsider. You know, and, it, and it's funny because I've been in this business now for a really long time. Like, I actually can't believe it. Like, I get to work with Gina because she works in this industry too. And, I, you know, like, I cannot believe I've been doing this industry for about 20 years. <coughs> and it's funny because this, the, one of the guys I get to work with a lot, uh, he's the COO actually of the company, he said, so he was describing, he said, he said, well, the thing about Mary is she still has a fundamental sort of disdain for the corporate <laughs> and wanting to change it. You know, but it, I think what it is more is it's not a disdain at all. It's actually that constant thing of, of uh, feeling a little bit like an outsider and a little bit of outsider in terms of how I think about things and how to solve things. And so, you know, just a tiny bit on my background. Um, I probably, probably give you a little window into it because I told you I was having a major crisis. <laughs> so, I mean, actually, I mean, actually, part of what I love about life, too, though, is honestly, I do feel like the things that have formed me the most in a positive way are the things that were, like, the things that actually didn't go so well in my life, you know? And so I grew up in New York City. I grew up, I was the youngest of three kids. My dad was a working New York actor. Uh, which meant that we didn't, we didn't work a lot. <laughs> he was a classic working New York actor, and he, and but it, I learned so much about passion from him because he was, he was the type like he would not do those other jobs to make money to support his acting. He believed that if you were passionate about it, you were going to do it. You were all in, and that's what you did. You know, and and talk about a tough career, because it really was a career of making yourself incredibly vulnerable, throwing yourself out there every day, constant rejection, actually. Um, and, you know, and then again, for us, you know, growing up, there was, a, you know, there was a little strain, and there was a good sprinkling of all the other kinds of dysfunctions that a lot of us have as we're growing up, and challenges, or alcoholism, or all sorts of different things that were in the stew, all of which really formed me in ways that I think uh, got me to that point of saying that I think the most important thing is, is uh, you know, is really being a contributing member of society and learning how to love and be loved and, and, and building those connections in everything you do and how you think about the world and what you're trying to accomplish. So they really came out of those, those same experiences. Um, and I also, growing up in that kind of a family on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which was not the Upper West Side that it is today at all. <laughs> it was very, very different. Um, I also grew up with like a total orientation towards the arts. So that's what he was, and that's where the meaning of life was. Thank you very much. Like, I really felt sorry for the business people in my building. <laughs> <laughs> the way the hierarchy works in New York City, if you don't know, in apartment buildings, it is if you're on the low floors, it's the lower income strata, and the higher up the apartment building you go, the higher up because you have views and et cetera, et cetera. And I just remember this one guy in particular, I actually babysat for him once or twice, Mr. Hart, very nice man, very dressed in the nines, you know, suit and da 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 da. Very, very successful, very nice, you know. And But every time Mr. Hart would get off the elevator, if I were with my dad, one of us would always say the same thing, like, don't you feel sorry for Mr. Hart? <laughs> 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 we just felt like, what a sad, like, lucky like, dresses up. Is this always in an office all day? Like, it was just like, so you get it. Sure, like, that's how I grew up. I grew up with, like, this total, and I was an artist. I, 
I tested into one of actually the better public schools in New York City, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts, the, the school that actually the movie Fame was done about later. Um, and I did, I was an artist. I dropped math and science by the time I was 10th grade in high school. And I went to Keene State College in New Hampshire. Um, picked it because it was cheap. And it was, and it was, uh, and it was away from New York City. I wanted to get into the country, and uh, that's so. What I have done, everything I have done in life, has been a surprise to me. <laughs> everything I've done has been a surprise to me. So I wasn't trained to do what I do. Um, I didn't want to do what I do, <laughs> um, and probably that also gives you a sense of why. But like an outsider. So in case anybody's wondering, well, why the hell didn't you pursue art? Um, because really, honestly, I don't, I'm not that good at it. <laughs> and, and, and to tell you the truth, the other thing is, I think I didn't really, I didn't have the passion. I would much rather do art than math. That is true. Um, math and, so I, in, 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 in an academic setting, I would choose art any day of the week. Um, in terms of a professional setting, I was worried. And also, I grew up with a lot of financial insecurity, and I worked from as early as I could ever remember, and I supported myself from as early as I could ever remember. And I was terrified I wasn't going to eat if I decided to try to be an artist. So, so I fell into business. I fell into a job. I fell into an amazing job in New York City where I learned a lot about culture, actually. Um, there wasn't a lot of love in that culture, but I learned a lot about uh, culture, you know, a big piece of what we try to be at Green Mountain Power, which is fast and effective. We try to be fast, fun, and effective. Um, the place in New York was more about fast and effective. It was two crazy entrepreneurs who started the whole money market industry. It was called the Reserve Fund, and I started as a technical writer because I was a decent writer. I did take English. I did take a few things other than art, but I, so I did take English. I was a good writer. My brother's actually a journalist. Um, it runs in the family. So I, I became a technical writer, and I literally was in the right place at the right time because that whole industry took off. The fund was at about $200 million when I joined it, and by the time I was 27 years old, I was running most of the operations of the $3.5 billion fund in New York City. And that's, you know, and I fell into it. And what I loved about that job, what I really loved about that job, is actually the same thing I freaking love about this job today. What I loved about that job, and I think the reason I was, any success I had, was because I freaking loved people. I love people. I actually like the foibles even more than the good stuff. Like, I like, I'm interested in people. Like, I love, like, what makes them tick. I love our humanity. I love, I try to love my own. I actually have a harder time sometimes loving my own humanity and my own foibles uh, than I do others. But, um, you know, that was what I loved. Like, I was, I was, I love that. I think it came through. And I had a way of working with others that somehow together, the, the thing I love the most about working with other people is because together, like, that's where the magic happens. That's where the freaking magic happens. Like, not, like, I just love that, of like, you know, you have skills, I have skills, you have skills, but somehow if we all get together, the three of us try to do something, in my experience, if we go about it right, it's going to come out so much better than any one of us could tackle anything. And that's the part that I love. But I found myself in this situation at 27 that was not computing at all because of Mr. Hart and the elevator. And I was like, I'm becoming Mr. Hart. And it really scared me. And I'm like, I don't want to. And like, I, I, and good thing is, like, these are leggings. Like, pantyhose days are over. Like, I also, like, I did. I was talking to somebody about that today. She swears it was Hillary Clinton. I don't know who it was that changed things. And now pants are the thing. But that was a big thing. Like, I thought I could not go for a year pantyhose. Really. They're you guys should try them. I would love to try them on just once so that you can tell me how, what an awesome feeling it is, especially because they squeeze your toes by the end of the day. It's just terrible. So anyway, so I left that. I left. My, I had met my fiance and we came. I'm going on way too long. i got to show this up. But, um, left New York, came up to Vermont because I'd come here since I was a kid. We were engaged. He was kind of done with what he was doing. We moved up here. I figured I would waitress. I mean, really, honestly, because I waitressed in college. I liked it. I was because I like people. I got good tips. <laughs> so I was like, hey, I'll do well. We'll do that. We'll like quality of life. But my personality followed me, and I, I 
has done a, a, a whole bunch of fascinating, amazing things, and I love this state so much. And I love this state so much. I really do. That's why I love being part of things like this, because there's people here that I know you love the state too, right? And we're trying to innovate, and we're trying to change, and we're trying to bring economic development. I love this state. I really do. And I got to work for state government for a few years. Never thought I would do that. Worked under three governors in three and a half years. Fascinating experience. I moved up here in 1989. Um, I got to, you know, I started companies in Vermont. One of them, my husband, uh, runs. Uh, he's morphed it in a, in a really cool direction. It was actually the first. I moved up here with dogs from New York City. And it was before you could find anything to protect your dogs in hunting season. Now, common sense would have said to me, just stay out of the woods during hunting season. <laughs> but I'm a scrappy, gritty, willful little thing, and I wasn't going to do that. So I designed the first fluorescent orange kind of protective outerwear for dogs called Spot the Dog and launched that in Vermont. I actually think Vermont's the best place to start a business, too, honestly. I think it is the best place to start a business. You, you can have conversations like this. You have access to markets. You can create things. You know, and that's, and that's, what, uh, that's what we did. I actually was on the cover of the Free Press way back in 1993 with my dogs and their little orange fluorescent things. And, you know, people told me no one will ever buy this stuff. And now it's like a, a crazy market. It's awesome. And then my husband created the world's first energy bar to be shared with dogs. Uh, it's, it's delicious. I never share them with my dogs. They, actually, I bring them to GMP and everybody freaking eats them. It's hysterical. But it actually was featured on the Anderson Cooper show because it was, uh, yeah, they're called Yaff Bars and they're, they're amazing. And so if you want to hike with your dogs, the theory is you have something that is healthy. It's made with all dog healthy ingredients, but it's delicious food. So um, anyway, so I got I've gotten to do that in Vermont and I, I did a stint in banking in Vermont, uh, you know, and, uh, and really the whole, the whole, like the, the, the kind of common current through it all is just doing, you know, doing things where I felt like I could express my love of people, my sense of why, and, and working for the state was awesome, actually, in that regard. I had all sorts of attitudes and ideas in my mind of what it meant to work for the state, and I'll never forget the first time I drove to Montpelier and I looked at the mountains, and I looked at the valleys, and I thought, like, oh my god, like, I serve this. Like, that's, I serve this. And that's kind of the same feeling I get today. Um, so that said, yeah, so Green Mountain Power has, so, and the other funny thing is, so this Mr. Hart thing, the reason I tell that story is because it still can stick with me, like, years and years later. So when I was, so I, I there was a lot of shit that went down, like, like all at once, like it happens in life. Uh, many years ago, my mom died, had a miscarriage, had a horse died, had a house burned down, I haven't had a house burned down twice. I, it was it was just it was a crazy turn of events, and I found myself doing Spot the Dog and a consulting business, and I had the opportunity. I did a pitch letter to Green Mountain Power, actually. That's what happened. So I wanted to just work by myself, and they had an opening for a job, and I thought I'll just pitch them, and then I'll convince them just to use my company for their needs. It wasn't. I didn't think Spot the Dog was going to serve them. It was <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the strategic consulting work I was doing at the time. Anyway, I, and I ended up turning down the job three times. Not once, not twice, but apparently according to Chris Dutton, who was the CEO at the time, three times because I couldn't see myself working for a utility. I thought, okay, Mary, you didn't want to be Mr. Hart. You worked in New York in finance. You came to Vermont, you worked for government. You worked in banking. And now you're gonna go work for a utility? I was like, this is like too much, I can't do it. So it really was, honestly, it's pitiful, because it really, to tell you the truth, it was mostly, I think, pride and ego, because I couldn't see myself in that. And I think some of it was also, I was worried about the culture, because I was different. I loved the people that I met in the building. I love, you know, but it was very formal. It was pantyhose. That was, <laughs> it was totally pantyhose. It was very formal. To go in, you went into like this lobby that was like this big. You had to go up stone stairs to get to the CEO. You had to go through not one, 
two private secretaries <laughs> to get into his office. He was the nicest man. Gina knows. He was the nicest man. It all felt weird to me because it's like, what's this nice guy doing behind all this shit? So, like, <laughs> <laughs> really personalize this on tape. Oh, anyway. <laughs> so, you had to go through this to get to his office, and he had a private bathroom and a private conference room. And I was like, have you ever seen like an employee or a customer? <laughs> I was like, this is really strange. But anyway, so that was, it was the culture thing I was worried about, you know. So fast forward, but he was the most amazing man. It was a wild ride. We had so much fun together when he was there. And then I got the honor of becoming the next CEO in, in 2008. And the work we got to do together when Chris was there was the work of completely transforming the culture to be one of customer obsession, love of customers. You know, fast forward to where if you came to see me today, and I'd, I'd love to see anybody anytime in any of the offices I work at, but it's all open. You know, I, my desk is a stand-up desk right next to where the linemen come in and out during the day because I want to make sure they're not in the office a lot, so I like to be available <laughs> and be there and see them when they, you know, and build relationships and have relationships with folks. Um, so you know, we were able, and that was really the foundation of all the innovation that we're doing now. It really, I love the line, culture and strategy. I really do. Culture and strategy, I think, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I've never been a fan of, that was a big part of what I changed there, too. I'm not a fan of, like, these think tank things, and you come up with the best strategic plan, and you get the tiger team, and you lock them away for 10 years, and then they come out, and it's like this thing, and it sits on a damn shelf, and no one ever looks at it, and then you pull it out. It's just dumb. It's just dumb. I, I, you know, like if I, if we did that, like everything we've done is as much of a surprise to us as it may be to you. Like we didn't have this plan that said we're going to do Tesla power walls. Like we created a culture, a culture of customer obsession, a love of customers, and what <coughs> customers in Vermont love. For the most part, you know, and we survey customers obsessively to make sure we have a sense of what they love. None of it will really shock you. They want green energy. They want it for free. <laughs> I mean, honestly, really, right? Who wouldn't, right? And they and they never want an outage, right? I mean, that right? No, that sounds good to me too. Like, <laughs> I'm still working on free. I, you know, but our strategy really was born out of as I was transitioning to see. You know, it was like I was like, well, our customers have spoken. This is the future they want. We better get to work, you know. And now it's it's stressful again now for us because we are facing is is our customers know we had a bunch of years where we were able to keep rates flat or even decrease them a little bit, but we've had some bumps. We're having some challenges as we're going through this energy system transformation. But everything came out of that, out of being fast, fun, effective, loving, customer obsession, finding solutions, and being oriented towards the future. Um, and you know, and it really, honestly, when you read like what we've been recognized for, and I, I have to say, the good news and the bad news on like being one of the most innovative is—it's truly the good news and the bad news. It's true. <laughs> that actually scares me because we have a lot of challenges nationally and internationally around energy. Um, and I've gotten to see there are some amazing companies doing amazing things, but in the context of actually really packaging solutions, getting them out there to market, and being in the process of execution. One of the lines I also love besides culture and strategy is, good ideas, good ideas in my mind are a dime of freaking dozen. It's actually execution that's rare. It's execution that's rare. Because guess what, execution's actually scary. Ideas, I mean, that, you know, it's, it's really like how do you take that idea how do you bring it to, it, 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 I guess it gets back to what I talked about with my dad, it gets back to intense vulnerability too. I mean, I remember even with my dog product when I first had that idea, it was scary to pursue it. I told, I'll never forget, I told Mark, after I landed the first store, and it was all in there, and I had seen it, and I came home, he said, how do you feel? I said, I feel like somebody put my underwear on the table. <laughs> like it was, a, it was very, execution is scary. I don't know that we talk about that enough. I, I, you know, and actually I think the way we can mess up sometimes with innovation, not sometimes, a lot, I've seen this a lot, I saw this a lot in my banking days, 
A lot of times for where we mess up with innovation is because, because it's scary, and we don't want to just talk about it being scary, we over-process it. We overstaff it. We build big. We lose the garage mentality of innovation. We lose that. Like we try to really keep the scrappy, gritty garage mentality of innovation. You know, move to market fast. Don't be afraid to learn from it. Don't be afraid to say, oh, okay, that's not working. Love your customer through the whole thing and make it right by them so that they don't have to say that. But that's, you know, that I think is such a key to who we are and how we think. And so that's, so really I'll end with, because I got to end at some point. Um, uh, I don't know, I feel like I have a lot of coffee or something today. <laughs> but anyway, I'll end with, you know, so we are, what we're focused on now is how to really work with the customers we serve, not exclusively, because there's a lot of people out there, there's gonna be a lot more that are gonna be providing energy solutions to communities, to homes and businesses over the next couple of decades. But how do we do it in a way where we partner with you, where we're managing to help make this transformation to a community, home and business-based system that will be more resilient, it should be more economic long-term, more sustainable, um, and do it in a way where we're also leveraging all of those tools and those devices that we're doing, those new relationships with you, to try to also drive down the cost of the bulk system. So that we're not, we're working really hard to avoid what is predicted to happen, which is just spiraling electric rates <coughs> as people morph off of the grid system. So, I think that's enough. I'm gonna stop. How's that? Is that good? Right, and that, and having a team where 
you know, we're excited by working with each other. We're, we care about each other. Doesn't mean we don't ever have conflict, but so those are some of the many things that keep me excited about working. Can we go to the B Corp for a second? Because, I mean, you, I, when I hear about B Corps, it's Vermont Teddy Bear, it's, you know, um, small hog and things like that. Yep. Okay. But when you're talking about a utility, that had to be a much harder sell and a much more organic uh, cultural change mm -hmm. to, to get through. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the message to investors and everything? Yeah, no, I mean, for me, honestly, I feel like really what a B Corp symbolizes is what has always been intuitive to me anyway, which is, and I know this is not the only way to be successful, but to me, I have always felt actually like it's hysterical when companies are like shareholder value and blah, blah, blah. Like, I just feel like, I know there are some people, because I've worked with some of them, that that actually does excite them. I don't think that's the vast majority of human beings. <laughs> I think the vast majority of human beings are excited by feeling like they're contributing something, feeling like, like they're being recognized. The rest. So for me, a B Corp is so aligned with just basic fundamentals, reinforcing basic fundamentals that will create meaningful business success. So you're absolutely right. We, by the time we became a B Corp, we were a B Corp. So it actually really wasn't a tough sell to our investor because we were all, we had become that and we were achieving good outcomes for customers. And in our world, you know, we were achieving what we should achieve, which is just consistent financial metrics, right? Because that's what you want. You want us to be healthy because we need to reinvest in infrastructure, et cetera. So, um, but it was funny because when I met with Chris in that big office I told you about in the bathroom, and da, 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 um, I remember when I was trying to explain to him what I saw as the culture change. It was so funny because I said, I don't, I don't know what, I mean, do we need to become like the Ben and Jerry's of the utility world. So the fact that I got to stand with Ben and Jerry like that day was just like so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. Because that is in essence. It's like how do we think of ourselves as whatever theirs is 1% for good or you know 1% for peace. You know, how do we how do we have a higher calling for the work that we're doing? Because if we have a higher calling, we're gonna do better work. That's yeah. what would happen? If we had a national blackout, would Green Mountain Power be able to sustain themselves? Are they independent enough from the other companies? Yeah, so great question. So a national blackout would be super, super, I, you never want to say never. You never want to say never in this world, right, that we're all living in now. But that that is hard to wrap your head around because it's really a patchwork of systems around the entire country. But uh, that said, no, the short answer is we are not immune to what happens to the electrical system around us. We are interconnected with ISO New England. We're interconnected as, as we found out with the Northeast blackout, Vermont was okay, but that was a lot of luck as much as anything else because all of the system is interconnected. So you can have a domino effect. Very much the future we see though as being community, home, and business based is exactly accomplishing that, where we're doing series of smaller microgrids. And the work we're doing in homes or even with Tesla power walls, right? We get the opportunity to practice this all the time with weather events. How do you keep as many homes, businesses, and communities connected, no matter what's going on to the grid around you? So that is the future we're moving towards. It's not a future that happens overnight. And we are all, all interconnected. Um, I recognize that one of the questions about the experience you had as an entrepreneur um, with Spot the Dog, et cetera. And, and in your experience, um, the CEO level, and some of your travels and you know, the, the other CEOs that you met at this point have had a chance to meet and spend time with. Um, do you see a lot of personal entrepreneurial experience in some of those other individuals? And if so, do you see any correlation between uh, that that prior experience as an entrepreneur and then that sort of ability to be um, aware of and be comfortable with that scariness of of getting to market or of mm -hmm. you know. Um, getting past you and think it's all your underwear out for the world to see. Um, yeah. Do you see that sort of, are there any other CEOs that have that sort of too? I think it depends. I mean, I would say in the industry space I'm in now, no. I don't see a lot of it. And, and again, it, do, it, it it's not surprising nor necessarily 
uh, I mean, it, it, it makes sense because when you think about it, so much of this industry for so many decades was really around cultural values that were very different. It was really protect, preserve, defend, you know, you know, a lot of analysis, analyze things, to, you know, it was very, very different. Um, so I, I think we're starting to see that change. I think that, um, you know, but no, I don't see a ton of it in, in this industry. Um, but I have started to see shift and change. And I think, you know, and again, the CEO doesn't necessarily have to have it. Like they're, you know, I think good CEOs, you know, the first thing they have is self-awareness of all the things they're not good at, you know? Um, and you try to make sure that you have all of that in, the, in whatever team, or it doesn't even have to be a CEO, it could be anybody, right? If you're working with a team, you want to make sure that you're not hiring people that are all like you. You actually want to hire people that are like the opposite of you, in my experience, right? And bring a whole different bundle of skills and abilities, so, yeah. the very first um, slide or, or the first portion of the film um, is very telling. Scream Mountain Power, people would perceive as an entity. But it said, we are Green Mountain Power. And that just personalizes that and I think speaks really well to the culture that you built um, in connecting with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Is it, and, and you know, we're, I also use, like to use these opportunities to remind people, we actually are pretty, I mean, I know we're viewed big in Vermont, but there's 520 of us. I mean, there's a lot bigger organizations in Vermont. <coughs> 520 of us that work all around the entire state of Vermont, because we cover from Bennington to Brattleboro to St. Johnsbury to St. Albans. And so having that we is so important because, and that's one thing that people who work with us say, like, oh, it's so odd. Like, everybody swims in everybody's lanes. That's the expression people have been using with me lately. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but there is a piece of that, right? Because I think that's, like, we'll all, you know, we'll all be, like, over here because of this. And then, you know, storms, we're, we all work it. So, yeah, to me, it is, we are, yeah, we are stronger, for sure. It's we. Mm -hmm. So, yes? You just talked a lot about um, your obsession with your customers, which I think is really inspiring. What are some of the ways you turn that love for your customers into, breast, into uh, best practices to help you keep them engaged mm -hmm. and maintain that relationship? Oh, it's like in every, every day in every way. So it's funny. So while we have this we thing and swim in all lanes, we also do have a lot of what we brought with the culture shift. It's also, you know, um, discipline discipline around what we measure and what we want to get better at. So we have, like we measure like 60 some odd different things every single week from like call handling, <coughs> first call resolution, to you know everything that, that we have learned from our customers is super important to them. And we send that scorecard out to the entire company every Friday afternoon. So every employee in the entire company sees how we're doing. And we have a company-wide phone call um, at 7 a.m. every Monday morning that the, pretty much the entire company dials into, um, that we talk about big picture, we talk about what we're hearing from our customers. I might talk about this on Monday after talking to folks here. Um, you know, so we go through big picture things. We talk about safety because that's super important. Talk about loving people, that's the thing that scares me the most in this job is the safety of the people I work with. Um, and then we talk about the metrics and how we're doing on it. But, but it's informed, like every, it's everything in every way I can think of, honestly. And it's also been a huge part of, um, you know, we've also given a lot of freedom to people to run with solutions. So we've tried to remove bureaucracy. We're having a chat about this. I mean, we do have some, like any boundaries that we hit up against, some guardrails, like, the law, like, right? <laughs> like regulatory, like, you know, like there are, you know, we have guardrails as, as a society should, I suppose, it's a good thing. Um, but otherwise, it's really, you know, like, like I, I think if you talk to a, a lineman in, in the company, what they would tell you is they have a lot more freedom than they had years ago to resolve things on the spot themselves, to hunt things down, to get answers, to call for resources. So we've, we've removed a lot of that bureaucracy so that we can, you know, uh, uh, 
obsess and love the customer in the moment, and we've given a lot more freedom to like folks who serve customers on the phone. But we measure a lot of stuff that we know is important to them. Yeah. Mary, what does you, your company look like ten years from now? That's a great question. That's a great question. If if um, no, I don't say if we will be we will be we are an energy transformation. That's how we think of ourselves. So the reason we were the first utility, I think, anywhere to offer an off-grid package was because, not honestly because I thought a ton of Vermonters would want to literally disconnect from the power grid, but I thought it was a great opportunity for those customers that do, and guess what, we had 60 some odd customers who were interested, for us to learn about energy as a service, to think about how do we provide you with the lowest carbon, lowest cost, reliable solution for you Right? And build that muscle so that we're doing that in what I think, I think the reality will be more like what we've seen with cell phones and landlines, which is it will change eventually, but cell phones have been around a few decades. And like some 90 some percent of, of Americans still have landlines to their homes. So I see much the same thing with the power system. So we will be in the space, not, not uniquely, not on a monopoly basis, but we will be in the space of offering businesses, homes, communities, total energy solutions. And that's kind of, you saw the slides, we're doing this in Panton, also to get experience of what it means to be total energy. So we're helping customers now, as, as I speak, with dramatically reducing carbon, commercial customers. We're looking at significant storage projects with some commercial customers to dramatically improve their reliability. Uh, because again, Vermont is, is woods and farms and fields. And so sometimes customers are in difficult places to serve with grandpa's electric grid. Because at the end of the day, you can harden that system all you want, but when Mother Nature swoops in, it all becomes choice and fun. So I see us doing a ton more in that space. And using, earning our way in what we're, what we're obsessed with, because we're obsessed with customers, is earning our way into new value streams that then help to pay for sustaining the grid. So it's not, it's not about creating new sources of revenue for our investor, any of that. It's all doing it within the mothership of the regulated business so that we're any new revenues, like any new revenues we create over the Powerwall program or values we create go to support the, all the customers that we serve. So that's, because again, sales are declining. I don't know if you, like, since 2003, we've had no sales growth, all right? Vermonters are not using more energy between, you know, we, we, there's a few policy things we could do to help improve the, the, the math for customers on that, but the sales are flat. So we're earning our way into new value streams while we still have the, the important responsibility of investing in infrastructure that still serves the vast majority of Vermonters. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that a lot of people struggle with execution of the projects or ideas. And I actually see that a lot of the times it just fall into our education. You know, where, like, you know, for example, in my face in college, they say a lot of students kind of force to come up with these ideas, but they come up with great ideas, but they just don't yeah. know any further. Yeah. And somehow they feel like they should talk about education. Maybe there's some kind of training that we can provide to people, to students, to kind of just for them to feel more empowered yeah. and you know, and actually, you know, take in charge of the ideas. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough thing to unbundle, right? Because I mean I think there are. I think, you know, my my experience is people help people. So I think the most powerful thing is again to connect people, you know, with other people that will give them courage, you know, and help them think through how do I bring it to market? How do I execute? How do I, you know, and also talk about the human side of it, you know, which we spend a lot of time as a leadership team, like we talk about the human side of it. Like we talk about, it's okay if people talk about they're afraid, it's okay, right? Because it, if you don't talk about it, what it does is a lot of stuff just sort of quietly sabotages you. So it is about creating that environment and the resources, I would say, at the school to have mentors and have folks that can help guide you. Yeah. Mary, you, you 
you had an upbringing that was born in creativity in the art world. And there's quite a bit of good science now coming out that the businesses that have leaders that have some exposure to art are actually starting to excel. Are you seeing that in industries, in utilities, in your other, in your colleagues, in other corporations? I don't know that I've seen it, but I, but I know you're right. I mean, I, I read actually a really interesting article uh, that did link the arts background to certainly entrepreneurship. I mean, because that's really like, you know, by definition, I was taught not to color in the lines. I mean, that's just like <laughs> my definition. So. So, you know, and it actually worries me. I've, I've had a chance, like many of us, like one of the things I love about Vermont is we get to swim in a lot of lanes, and I've worked on education issues, I've worked on a lot. Of, one of the things that's really worried me is the over-focus we've done on STEM. I mean, like, it's just like that's the whole answer is like, you know, it's like get everybody into like STEM and make them decide by 10th grade what they want to be. And it, 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 great, if that's great, if that's awesome. If that's who you are, like, do it. Good. And you should have reinforcement. But, but I do. I think the I think the arts and creativity and all of that is like such an important part of you know the development process. Uh, Good time for one or two more. So I have a question about the the other power companies in Vermont, the small municipal yeah. you know power companies as well as the um, the, the co-ops. So is there an opportunity for Green Mountain Power to grow by including those, or do you see that remaining, them remaining independent? I see it remaining the way it is, really. I think that for Vermont, when we merged with CVPS, I think we became big enough, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I actually, I mean, maybe it's because I also like, I have great affection and admiration for all the peers that I get to work with at the co-ops and at uh, the municipals. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think that it, I, you know, yeah, we don't, we're, we're focused on the stuff we're doing. We're focused on partnering wherever possible. You know, a lot of stuff, I mean, Burlington Electric's doing very different stuff because they are already 100% renewable. We're 60% renewable, 90% carbon free in our portfolio. Uh, they're 100% renewable. Uh, they don't have the solar deployment going on in Burlington. So they have very different objectives and needs. And, uh, you know, Vermont Electric Co-op, well, I just had coffee with Patty from Washington Electric Co-op this morning. And, yeah, so no, I think it's double patchwork. Um, I'm very intrigued um, about your trying to bring sort of the, the micro grids to home, business, smaller mm -hmm. communities. Um, you know, first I'll say that I'm often subjected to power outages, and I'm always like, please God, you know, get that one really quick. Yeah. And I'm always blown away with the major storms, how quickly, yeah. like, the linemen are out there are. working tirelessly. And I love that Green Mountain Power doesn't mind touting their own horn and, like, mm -hmm. thanking their linemen. And then, like, yeah. I share that so that everybody else thanks them, too, because yeah. they they don't get enough credit for what they have to sacrifice. Yep. Um, so I really admire <laughs> their dedication. And um, so, how then can you transition to having these more micro grids to help, you know, individual communities not be so reliant on these major yeah. substations? Yeah, that's what we did. So we're doing that, you know, kind of one grid at a time and one solution at a time. And that's what we did in Rutland when we did the solar storage project. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a circuit there that we can keep going in a major event. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, we actually have proposed right in front of the regulators this now, three additional uh, microgrids where we're doing <coughs> solar and storage in a small grid. And for, I will say, for the customers who have gone with our storage solution, so far they have been performing way better than advertised in terms of the longevity of providing that backup power. And again, that's why we did this program. I mean, just like you could go out and spend thousands of dollars on a generator, you could go out and spend thousands of dollars on a storage device. But through our program, we're doing as an option for customers who want it, it's $15 a month. And that basically eliminates most outages in Vermont are 2.25 hours, actually. So um, it eliminates the vast majority, and then what we have had, even in that massive windstorm we had, we had customers, their power wall actually carried them through the entire uh, uh, event, uh, particularly with the customers who have it paired with solar. So, so you can have that battery backup without even having 
Oh yeah. Oh no, if you have one in your home, if you get one installed in your home, um, you, you, yeah, you, have, you have seamless backup power, which is what's really nice. You don't have to do anything. Like most people with a generator, unless you get like the really expensive ones that are buried and all interconnected with your home panels, mm -hmm. um, you have to pull them out. You have to, it's, and, and there's safety concerns or whatever. So what's really nice with the power wall is it just sits in your basement or your garage, or as Elon Musk would say, your living room wall is actually where you should really put it. It's so beautiful. But most haven't done that so far. <laughs> Not finding that option is big, but um, and then you did you literally like actually we had a customer write us. She did a blog. It was so cute because she said, and I was so mad because I missed it because the power went out and I was asleep and I never even knew it because I woke up and the power was still on. And all my neighbors told me I missed it out. She, she wanted to like I don't know what she's gonna do like watch it, but it was. You know, so. So that, but that's the, that is the whole point of that. And what's really cool with that is we're also using it. So when you're not using it, right, we're using it sure. to help moderate, like when we have those horrible days of peak cold or peak heat. So we use it in a way so that we're avoiding costs that we otherwise would have for the benefit. And that's why we can do it for 15 bucks a month. That's cool. Yeah. So, sorry. That's cool. We're probably done, right? Yeah. Okay. One more quick one. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. So you mentioned that execution is yeah. the scary part, and that's mm -hmm. why it matters. And throughout your whole talk, you mentioned hitting a wall of fear a lot. Is there anything that you personally do to manage that fear to yeah. become successful? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, it goes back to that conversation I talked about in my twenties. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's a lot. I mean, it's it's a lot of it. Honestly, a lot of it. It helps. I always come. I really do come back to the basic of checking my motives of what I'm trying to execute on. You know, is it out of my love and my obsession? Has ego and whatever craziness gotten in there, right? Or is it, or is it truly, right? Is it truly feeling like the right thing to do? And then what I try to do is just disassociate myself. I try to take myself out of the equation. That's actually what I try to do. I try to take myself out of the equation and I think, well, like if I if it ends up like a failure or like humiliate like whatever, right? That's not important. What's important is the motives of doing it and moving forward and not worrying about, you know, so I think once you do that and then there's a lot and like and then I just I take care of myself. I run, I meditate, I do a lot. So, I'm um, high maintenance. So, I just feel like if I'm not doing that stuff, though, then it's easier to get, it's, it's, life gets harder. So, that's the short version of it. Right. And so Mary for coming all the way down here from Burlington. South Europe. So we're, we're super fortunate to have a really great um, lineup of speakers over the last couple of years and everyone has been a rock star and uh, Mary, you're no exception. We really appreciate you taking the time and uh, mark your calendars uh, for June 7th for Michael and Lewis for our next talk and then just a uh, quick uh, thank you. Just, just to remember there are sponsors, Bank of Bennington, VSCCU, Abundant Sun, GBH Studios, the Grill at Mount Anthony Country Club, and the Bennington, Re uh, Region, of Bennington Region Chamber of Commerce. And uh, feel free, more of yours. Have another cocktail.